actually, I didn't have a formal role as it were. And there were some people whom I observed, like Dr. Z, I was working with the Black Community Coalition with Reverend Mac Charles Jones and mm -hmm. Councilman Charles Hasley and um, Phil Curls of Freedom Incorporated, had uh, the opportunity to be a part of that group, in addition to having a radio program on KPRS, which was actually called Concerning Learning. So my responsibility was to be more a reporter than an activist. If you don't mind, let me give a little bit of my background and how I came to it, what my input was. In uh, Chicago, Illinois, where I lived for 38 years, where I started teaching in 1964, I arrived in Kansas City in 1980. So being an educator for 16 years before arriving in Kansas City, I had a responsibility at Operation Push to head the education division. When I left Operation Push to work for the Center for New Schools doing innovative uh, research and uh, techniques for urban schools, I found myself back at Operation Push to direct the Chicago Push for Excellence, now Push Excel program. Two things that might be of note are one, my own experience at age 13, coming from the Ida B. Wells housing projects on the south side of Chicago and attempting to become the first black student to enroll at a school then, Harper High School. Attempting to be the first black student found me being attacked by the white students. So I was stoned, I was bottled, and that was uh, Pepsi bottles before plastic. I lived in a house that had 24-hour police protection because the house had been bombed with our becoming a black family on that street. So it wasn't bombed while we were there. The white family was actually bombed. Therefore, my first personal introduction to something called desegregation was in 1955 when I was um, discouraged. Therefore, I ended up at a predominantly white school in Chicago, Illinois. Now, I'm giving that background to say that my elementary school was Wendell Phillips Elementary School. I wanted to go to the black high school, Wendell Phillips High School, with uh, my black friends. It did not happen, and I was blessed that my experience at Lynn Bloom High School in Chicago was a positive experience. But while now updating 1977 uh, uh, to 1980, working with Reverend Jesse Jackson, I wrote a paper. The title of the paper was In Search of Quality Education at Home, a Black Position in Favor of Neighborhood Schools. I was not for school desegregation. I wanted to shore up black schools. Now I only give that background information because uh, the Reverend Dr. Mac Charles Jones was the head of the Black Community Coalition and one of the things that I did was to offer that paper in anticipation of desegregation in Kansas City, Missouri. So when I met Theodore Shaw, with whom I think I had a good relationship, I at least wanted him to know that I would be the wrong person to advocate in behalf of desegregation in its form of busing black children into white neighborhoods. But I could offer that, but not as an official in the Black Community Coalition. 
As it relates to Plan 6C, this was more something that I heard about than I experienced in as much as I did not arrive in Kansas City until 1980. Additionally, in 1984, there was a tragedy in Chicago, Illinois, where a young man, Benji Wilson, had been shot, top basketball player in the nation, and those of us who had worked with gangs on the south side of Chicago found ourselves returning home. So I actually went back to Chicago from 1984 until 85. When I returned, February 23rd, 1985, it was a meeting that I missed. But that was the formation of the Black Community Coalition and my re-entry into things Kansas City. So that was before the institution of, I guess, what Kansas City might refer to as the new DSEG plan, DCA. as it were. One of the things that I remember was, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Z only because I can't remember Zelma's last name, and why would I not? Is it Zelma Harris? Was she? Yes. Uh, Dr. Zelma Harris mm -hmm. uh, was heading up a committee that was comprised of both educators and community leaders. I think there was also a political factor. What I recall was it was very important as it relates to leadership that there be equity and parity where schools uh, were concerned as well as opportunity and what i mean by that and i pray that i am not mistaken in my interpretation of what i was seeing is obviously opportunity meant all students having the right to go to schools that were quality schools However, if I interpreted it properly, equity and parity meant that whatever school you attended ought to have the resources that would be equal to any school. So therefore, what I was recalling was not just the political and social factors, but the economic factor that saw the rebuilding of schools in the urban core, or if not the rebuilding, certainly the rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So when I think about Central Computers Unlimited Classical Greek uh, Magnet School, when I think about uh, Southwest uh, Science, when I think about Paseo School of the Performing Arts, I think about the equity and parity where the physical plant was concerned. But when I think about students at Central High School living on one side of Cleveland Avenue uh, going then to Van Horn as opposed to um, Central, uh, then I think about uh, an effort to give opportunity to black students to attend predominantly white schools. One of the things that I found not only in Kansas City, Missouri, but also in Boston, interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know things that were going on in Chicago and uh, other places was uh, attitudes on the part of people of color were often reactionary. What I mean by that is because of uh, the level of protest from uh, those who were vehemently against black students, students of color going to uh, their schools, caused an almost equal and opposite reaction in the minds of black people saying, you cannot stop us and you won't. The peculiarity of the re uh, reactionary attitude was, it appeared that since you, meaning the predominantly white uh, communities, have greater resources, better buildings, uh, more uh, expenditures per pupil, uh, there's nothing you can do to keep this movement from going ahead. For me, when I use the term peculiarity, one of the reasons that I had an attitude about that was I felt that the quality of teachers, the quality of families, 
the quality of students in my own community were already equal. What we were lacking was access to opportunities to explore our untapped potential because our buildings were falling apart or we had not the same exposure, and this is nationwide. Mm -hmm. That almost trick being played on us that made us feel that somehow we became better by sitting next to someone who doesn't look like us caused an attitude reacting rather than proacting saying we can do this well in our own community and that's what my paper was about okay. a black position in favor of neighborhood schools okay. you know it's very interesting because i was um, uh, blessed uh, to be asked to do some work at uh, Melville, and I think it might have been Oakville, but in uh, the uh, St. Louis area. And um, when I was working with the students there, they were referred to as transfer students. So the transfer students from inner city St. Louis were now, quote, being allowed, unquote, to attend suburban schools and I came in as a singular black male to situations where there was not a black administrator, there was not a black coach, there was not a black teacher, there was not a black custodian. I'm not sure that they had black boards. What our young people saw was a confused bag of, if this is supposed to represent opportunity, why do I feel alienated when I leave my own community? Mm -hmm. We set up a situation where our young people were confused as to something called, quote, ownership, unquote, versus um, permission uh, to go. Uh, our young people were supposed to perceive it to be the privilege to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now then, I would suspect that they had to be a little confused because if the idea is to give me quality of academics, have you forgotten about giving me a quality of life? Have you forgotten about giving me a welcome community where I might attend, as opposed to a hostile community that is begrudgingly allowing me to attend? My feeling was that we as the adult population in our strong need to advocate for privilege did not do as much as we might have done to assure the young people that they were just as good, just as smart, and um, uh, hopefully mm -hmm. just as welcome. Right. So we didn't have the control over the just as welcome part, but I think we could have done a greater job at helping the young people know what part of history uh, they played. You know, it's interesting, and uh, I, I, I hope that it's all right for me. I don't know how the, um, uh, this taping is dated, uh, but we're looking at June 22nd, 2017. Mm -hmm. And I really regret to say that I've heard some attitudes among young people today that were similar to what was going on in those days, and this is what I mean by that. Our youth council was called the Generation Rap Youth Advisory Council. Right, I remember that. The Youth Advisory Council had meetings on Mondays, and when we stated our creed, the creed started out a coalition of African-American youth, and it talked about positively 
their contributions to society. So here we are with a group of African-American youth, grades 9 through 12, and they were concerned. My school does not celebrate Black History Month. They were concerned that I transferred from one school where I was an officer in my class and I must go to another school where I have to start all over. Uh, they were concerned in uh, some cases, I'm the captain of the football team and now I might make the team. So those are kind of some natural concerns because working in Waterloo, Iowa, it was similar when a school closed, students had to transfer mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with color. You go from one school to another, you lose your school colors, you lose your office in the student council, whatever. But the factor was exacerbated by race because it looked like I was being neglected because of my color. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that from an historical perspective, we as black people ought to feel and show a significant amount of pride in our young people who had to navigate the shores of desegregation and did as well as they did. Mm -hmm. It was not the same as 1957 in Arkansas or 1954 in Topeka, but it was just as formidable because we thought we wouldn't have to traverse those same waters again, where there was hostility based upon simply going into someone else's community or territory. Okay. So what I was hearing from students was, uh, this is all right, but I don't feel as comfortable as I should. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're uh, talking about me uh, personally, obviously I would go all the way back to 1955 when I was 13 years old and integrated Lindblom High School in Chicago, Illinois. I would have been the first at Harper, but there were some black uh, students at Lindblom High School. So the role that I played was attempting to be the best a student I could be because back in those days, not only your parents, but the entire community would send you away saying, don't embarrass me. Mm -hmm. So we had to try to be the brightest and the best. Now, as it relates to my role as teacher, 1964, and working with the Reverend Jesse Jackson on Operation Push in the 70s, that was more advocational and attempting to help families and students feel comfortable wherever they went mm -hmm. and providing for them mentoring and tutorial services that would help them to achieve excellence and then come back to a community where they felt comfortable and we could reassure and make sure they had the psychosocial tools uh, to succeed. And then you mentioned the Black Coalition here in Kansas City, the, where I would imagine played a significant role. That played a very significant role in Kansas City. It was BCC, the Black Community Coalition. And uh, indeed, uh, again, from an advocational standpoint, attempting to make sure that economically we were on footing that would guarantee the buildings, for instance, and I was talking about, uh, if you look at the new Paseo, if you look at $32 million spent on uh, Central Computers Unlimited Classical Greek Magnet School, um, I think that, to my chagrin, we as adults could have been a lot more to help families to understand their role in making sure that young people achieved academically as opposed to simply making history going to other schools. Mm -hmm. Now, here was, here's, an, here's an interesting thing about uh, being privileged, and I thank uh, Carter Broadcasting for allowing me to have 
a teen talk show on an FM station. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it began with the program, which was called Concerning Learning. So my program was about education at about that time. The role then that I had to play was being able to give voice to all sides of an argument. Mm -hmm. I, I can recall being allowed to be in on meetings where uh, the qualifications were well above my pay grade. I'm a simple teacher. I started teaching in 1964. I had years of history, but my colleagues were a lot better than I, but I had a platform having a radio program. So I had the opportunity as it relates to my particular role of being able to interview, give voice, and interpret several sides of an argument, admitting that my prejudice was more towards advocating for black students and shoring up our own community. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to that program every morning. Praise God, mm -hmm. you're very kind. <laughs> so what do you recall as academic outcomes for students during all of this, starting in the uh, 80s in terms of Kansas mm -hmm. City? and your role as a community member? Let me, let me say to you in answer to that question uh, that uh, too few of, too little of our conversation revolved around academics. Mm -hmm. We were so caught up in the social sphere, safety and order. You will recall Ron Edmonds, Effective mm -hmm. Education, and uh, in his list, there was high expectations as well as leadership but also in that list, and Larry Lazat car carried it on, was safety and order. And we became real involved in the safety and order issue as we are today, mm -hmm. as opposed to academics. Again, I feel that we must express more, uh, more pride and appreciation for our students who matriculated well because we dwell so much on the negative and what was wrong, what was dysfunctional, families that didn't do their parts. But we really had some serious success stories. Now, I would be remiss if I did not say, we've got a long way to go. We should have uh, indeed talked more about academics. And I didn't see, Dr. Carruthers, a significant change based upon desegregation in the academic outcomes of those for whom we advocated. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you uh, one of the things that was interesting and was reflected in the paper about which I spoke, A Black Position in Favor of Neighborhood Schools. Some of the unexpected social outcomes was the degree of respect that white students found for black students. One of the significant social outcomes was that those who were in charge seemed a lot more out of touch than the families who were glad to see now that these friendships were coming about that crossed racial lines. It's very interesting that as uh, we look around now, the heavy degree of racism that is found in the United States of America sometimes neglects to look at the degree to which we don't see each other in those very clear, distinct ways as we once did. It's hard mm -hmm. because uh, when you look at, uh, for instance, police black community relations, uh, when you look at harsh rhetoric via social media, when you see so much of that played up, we say, boy, we're going backwards. But on the other hand, some of the social outcomes were black students being able to negotiate in uh, what was perceived as a hostile world because they learned with whom uh, they were dealing 
at a younger level and were able to deal with it when they have become now adult leaders. We saw the integration of sports teams, extracurricular activities, those kinds of things that turned out to educate many white people, many majority uh, community people as to the quality of black students with whom they were matriculating. So there were some positive social outcomes. I think that um, we who were in positions of what was referred to as leadership and again, I had an opportunity to work with leadership because I had my radio program and I was interviewing folks on an ongoing basis, um, could have accentuated the positive where our own community was concerned. Uh, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, there was a program on TV, and I don't remember the stars of the program, but it was called The White Shadow. And uh, the White Shadow program showed a white, I think, athletic coach in the middle of the urban community and his role seemed to be from week to week, and I think I'm recalling this properly, to help solve the problems of these poor, dysfunctional black children. I think that too often we look at it from a cultural deficit model as opposed to an untapped potential model. And I think that our responsibility now in retrospect should have included to a higher degree encouraging the positives of our young people and, by the way, their families, rather than dwelling on the negative. You will recall, because of your civil rights background, that we used to use uh, the term the paralysis of analysis. Mm -hmm. And I was interpreting paralysis of analysis uh, to mean that we have been so enamored with our ability to state the problem that we have neglected to move on to the solutions. Mm -hmm. And there are many solutions in the black community. And here again, if I get another media opportunity, it will be to show Kansas City the rich resources we have in our community working now to shore up the community and there are efforts to work together. What changes do you think are needed to improve outcomes for school, for students in today's urban schools? Okay, you said what changes are needed. And you will uh, perhaps recall, I don't know, and the only reason I think you might recall this is because I did this particular presentation so often, mm -hmm. so people uh, recall it. But I traveled the United States doing a lecture to which I referred as no one rises to low expectations. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that I think that we need to do is to have high expectations for young people who are in our community as opposed to dwelling on the negative. So you will hear me repeat that often. The second thing is my understanding is Dr. Mark Bedell, new superintendent, Kansas City, Missouri School Districts, is making through Dr. Darrell Davis a concerted effort to bring mentors into the school district. And I think that's something that makes eminent sense as it relates to helping particularly young black males to understand who they are from an historical perspective as well as who they can be when a community believes in them. I think also it is imperative that young people and families understand that children do not attend school alone. When a child enrolls, the entire family enrolls. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have a responsibility to families to help them to understand the roles that they play in their children's education, not only from an intellectual standpoint, but also practically speaking, helping them to know what that role means, mm -hmm. how you can help them either 
with their homework or find resources to do that. How we can create, as the Black Family Technology Awareness Association says, closing the digital divide. I think also that we need uh, to do a good job with our communications media to help present the real story mm -hmm. about who we are as a people and who uh, we can be from a positive, deeper perspective than we do. Mm -hmm. And I think also that the congratulations that are due to students who are matriculating well should outperform the, 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 the uh, despair that we show over students who are doing poorly. And we must remember our athletes and our artists and our entertainers, but please don't let that override remembering our artists and our scientists and our teachers who come from our community. I think that, um, gee, I would uh, suggest that if we're going to talk about integration, too often we're talking about geography. 2017, and we continue to celebrate Black History Month. If black history is not inculcated into the fabric of curricula throughout the United States of America, then we will forever be trying to integrate rather than participate so that we have to teach it at another kind of level. Uh, here's an example. I'll try to do this very quickly. The best, I said the best, African-American history assembly program I have ever seen. Forgive the personal reference and not to boast, but I have been blessed to work with teachers in all but three states in the United States of America, 47 states. The best African-American history assembly I've ever attended was in Idaho Falls, Idaho, at a white school on a white stage. Wow. The reason I bring that up is because it ought to be that all students appreciate our history mm -hmm. rather than the great emphasis on our own people's need to appreciate our history and Native Americans and uh, others, Hispanics, but Irish <laughs> and Italians, all of that is fine, but it ought to be woven into the fabric of curricula so that it is not a surprise that we have to celebrate. Oh no, this is what we do. You don't have to make a big, big thing out of this. This is who we are. 